Greetings, everyone. This is Aruskini Jim, back with another episode of the Sit Rep Podcast. Today, we're back at the miniature table for a game of Mark Ritchie's tactical combat system in 15mm. The scenario is the Commonwealth counter-assault to retake the Galabat Fortress in Sudan, recently taken by Italian troops that were invading out of neighboring Abyssinia, or modern Ethiopia. So in these days, uh, Sudan is a British colony, and Abyssinia, or again, Ethiopia in today's terminology, was under Italian occupation. This is soon after the start of the British and Italian War in Africa, which actually started in East Africa. I know North Africa is the more famous part. That's, you know, Montgomery, Rommel, Auchinleck, Patton later on, you know, the, the part that everyone knows about. This campaign actually starts down in, again, modern-day Sudan, Abyssinia, Somalia, Eritrea, places like that. Only a little bit later does the more famous campaign in North Africa get started. So starting in August, September, again, a little bit before the main campaign gets started in Egypt, the Italians, out of their holdings in their part of Somalia, Abyssinia, Eritrea, start attacking British positions in, again, Sudan, uh, the British part of Somalia. Somalia was occupied by two different colonial powers in those days. And they were even bombing people in places like Tanzania and Kenya, and uh, never mind all that. But one of the places they try to invade, at least partially, is Sudan. So they jump across the border and they take that fort, that big mud brick fort that you see right there. That's what I'm trying to defend. I'm the Italian player, or I'm one of the Italian players. We have recently invaded a short distance into British-controlled Sudan, took that fort, and now the British are going to try and take it back from us. So we'll see how it goes. Okay, so here is the mud brick fort of Galabat that I have been charged to defend, me and my teammate, John. The first weapon that we're looking at here is my 25mm anti-tank rifle. Then we have a 25mm anti-aircraft gun. Both of these Breda guns are very, very useful against ground targets as well as air targets. I have a 65 and a 100 millimeter field gun there for direct fire support. I've got uh, my major, that's my garrison commander, and there's my radio man. Notice how I have the trucks parked to sort of give him a little bit of extra protection in case some indirect fire drops into the courtyard. I have a 45 millimeter mortar there, uh, some colonial Eritrean troops there in that bluish gray along the sides, and some Italian infantry along the front parapet. Uh, I'm pretty set up for a positional defense. Now, this is the spot of the table I'm most worried about. This is the closest piece of cover. You see that distance there is actually pretty short. That's as close as the enemy is going to be able to get to me and launch a direct assault on the fortress. John is commanding those buildings over there. He's got some black shirts. He's got the rest of the Italian uh, regular infantry. And what we're trying to do is set up a crossfire you can see here into this expected kill box right there where I think the enemy is going to try to attack across. It's uh, it's a pretty deadly stretch of open ground. I'm not going to lie. He does have some high ground there under that little chart sheet there. Um, that chart or right beneath that chart is the hill. That is going to bother me a little bit. Notice there's a direct line of sight between my guns and his expected artillery positions. I'm pretty sure he's going to set up artillery on the high ground and uh, it might get nasty there. We also have some camel cavalry, believe it or not, hiding out in those buildings. Those guys are kind of glass cannons, as cavalry often is in early World War II. Pretty nasty, surprisingly nasty, on an initial attack, but after that, they tend to wither very, very quickly. Um, it's not about how tough you are in World War II, it's all about how well you can hide. And it's tough to hide a six foot man while sitting six feet high on a horse. You're basically 12 feet tall. And um, yeah, you're not gonna hide very well. And horses are not bulletproof, sadly. Uh, we do have some Italian armored cars here, along with, uh, again, those aforementioned black shirts, light machine guns, heavy machine guns, medium machine guns. We have an aircraft that might come on the table, depending on whether or not I can keep my radio. That's why I'm protecting that radio so well. Historically, the very first British bomb took out the Italian radio, and that was pretty much the end of uh, Italian hopes of air and artillery support. We have some tanks, well, 
um, Italian tanks. Sorry, I have some uh, um, L33s, L35, CB33s. These are like literally absurdly tiny tanks. They make Japanese tanks look good. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much the table. So we're clearly on a very, very positional defense. Um, I'd say 90% of our game is more or less in the setup phase. Uh, I have tried to set up some pretty basic fundamentals, make the most of my field fortifications, make the most of my lines of sight, take a look at what cover remains on the table and sort of predict where the enemy's gonna come. There's a better view of the hill now that that uh, other player has moved the chart there. So that hill is what bothers me. That hill is, is a scary piece of terrain. I'm gonna have to put that under some pretty decent fire right off the bat. I'm almost positive he's gonna put artillery in there. Forward observers, heavier machine guns, and so on and so forth. I believe his main attack is gonna come out of those woods there to the south. That's what I would do if I were them. All right, so here we go. Wow, um, this game has officially kicked off with a bombing mission. My 25 millimeter tried to shoot at the level bomber as he was flying overhead, flat out missed. So I'm getting my bad rolls out of the way. And then the bombs came down. The bombs did hit the castle twice or hit the fortification twice. Ironically, uh, Jennifer Burdu was aiming for the guns, missed my guns and instead hit the fort. Wiped out half of my colonial infantry on the first die roll. You'll notice four figures are already gone. And uh, hit the front, like the bomb literally skipped off the front glacis of that, of that curtain wall there on the, the front of my castle, or my, my fort. Uh, wiped out half of this row of infantry. Remember, there was like nine or 10 infantry there. Now there's like half that. My commander amazingly survived. You see the crater where the bomb hit. Those six little red puff balls um, are marking damage. Uh, there, there are mechanics in the game where the, the wall will eventually collapse if it's hit with enough, uh, with enough high explosive. They're well on their way. It's a big eight foot thick mud brick fort. It's just been hit by a couple thousand pounders. So, ouch. My castle, uh, I keep calling it a castle. My fortification has already seen better days. But my commander survived, my radio survived, and my guns have survived. Go ahead and blow up the castle, bro. I mean, I've, I've got my guns, I've got my radio, and I've got my commander. Um, I'm actually pretty pleased with the result. It looked scary. A big mushroom cloud, two mushroom clouds over my fortification. And again, half of one of my whole uh, colonial Eritrean uh, infantry units, rifle units, blown off the table on the first die roll. And um, yeah, that was that. Speaking of things that are scary looking, but not that bad in real life, here is the British armor. A lot of two pounders in there, quick firing 40 millimeter two pounders that, uh, as I'm sure you guys know, have no high explosives. My castle's not really afraid of them. There is one close support tank in there though, and I don't know which one it is. So we'll see how that goes. All right, so the British forces, I keep calling them British forces. Some of them are British. Some of them are fr from two other regiments. Nowadays, one of them would be India. One of them would be Pakistan. Back then they called all of that stuff India. Uh, Nepal, Bhutan, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh was all basically India in those days. Uh, the Indian um, possession or dominion of the British Empire. Uh, so technically Pakistani troops plus Indian troops plus some British troops and a lot of British armor is what technically is on the table here. Uh, the big surprise for me, and I'm not going to lie, I'm pleased as punch to see it. The enemy is not attacking from the most dangerous piece of terrain on the table. They are not coming at me right down through that palm grove, which doesn't provide the best protection, credit to my opponents, but this weird kind of uh, left hook with all that armor there on the northwest corner of the table. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on there. So my 25 millimeters are taking shots at British armor. Uh, I've taken out a, I've taken out one piece of uh, British armor and, and uh, damaged another one. And I have charged with my camel cavalry. So a lot of them have already been destroyed, but the rest of them are there. Spoiler alert in full honesty, because I'm going to talk a lot of trash about my opponents. I also screwed up here. I literally drifted with my 65 millimeter field gun and took out one of my own cavalry. Uh, friendly fire at danger close support. Sorry, dude. Um, 
However, there was a special rule in the scenario that allowed these guys to get a double move first charge. Only one and at the very table. So I basically charged him as he was coming on the table. So they were hiding out in all those little round forts. They get a 96 centimeter move. And if I can make it into base-to-base -base contact with the enemy, they will not get to shoot at me because you're not allowed to shoot into active melees. Why didn't they take opportunity fire or reaction fire in this game? Because they were just coming on the table. You can only take reaction fire if you're standing still. Well, if you're coming on the table, you can't be standing still. So pretty much as they're coming onto the table, I do get one spoiling attack. I knew what I was going to do. That was before I knew this special move. This special rule made the attack like 10 times more deadly. So once I heard that special rule get activated, I said, oh, hell yeah, definitely do it. We overran his forward observer. We took out two of his leaders. We've largely blinded the enemy force. So here are some more views from the Commonwealth side of the table. You see more British armor burning here. It's not really their fault. It's some very, very light stuff. But what I'm uh, really looking at here are some more of my camel cavalry that are about to overrun that plus two. That's the British force commander about to get shish kebobbed on the end of my uh, camel lances. And here's another melee in progress where he's about to lose another plus one lieutenant. Now, in truth, all my cavalry is going to get annihilated. That's okay. It was a spoiling attack, but I took out two of his lieutenants, his force commander, and perhaps most importantly, the forward observer. So that's going to largely muffle the British artillery. It's not just about taking out units. It's about reducing his tactical flexibility and um, reducing his ability to bring in the high explosive stuff I'm not worried about his armor piercing stuff, but his high explosive stuff that is going to be able to damage uh, my fortification. Um, so there's a sort of a half-hearted attack coming at me there uh, out of the southwest, but my fort, as you can see, I've mobilized my reserves. My uh, commander is still there. My radio man is still there. The fort's doing pretty well. I'm very happy with that side of the table. My friend John over here commanding the Italian right, uh, again, I'm not entirely sure why the Commonwealth decided to throw the main bulk of their force at the Italian right when the objective is to the left. Um, I'm not going to complain, but that's cool. Now what I'm trying to do here is draw a very specific line of sight between those round buildings and a specific British tank. The way the, the those 810 cruiser tanks work, most of them are the usual two-pounder gun, which is kind of useless. Uh, at least against the castle. One of them is a close support tank, but I only identify which one of them is a close support tank once they fire at me. So he's now fired at me. I gotta target that specific tank. So please stay tuned for part two and see how the rest of this turns out.